You're listening to the Living in Bosnia and Herzegovina podcast. Hello and welcome to another edition of the podcast with me, David, where we find out more about Bosnia and Herzegovina, that heart-shaped, very misunderstood country in the Western Balkans. It would be great if you could subscribe to us, as that way you'll never miss any new episodes. And also, why not leave a review? as that helps us to plan and produce better content for you. In the show notes, you will also find links and additional info for this episode. So, let's crack on. Today, I catch up with Susie Mason, who 20 years ago was one of the main drivers behind Speed Queen, a club based in Leeds in England. So, what has Leeds got to do with Bosnia and Herzegovina, you may well ask. You're listening to the Living in Bosnia and Herzegovina podcast. Susie Mason, what's it like in uh, the People's Republic of Yorkshire today? Well, it's actually beautiful and sunny, which is quite remarkable and very, very unusual for the end of January. But it's a beautiful, gorgeous, cold, bright, sunny day. So I'll take that as an omen to be talking to you. Susie, all those years ago, I think it was 19 years ago, I got in contact with you about coming to Bosnia and Herzegovina. We can talk uh, as much as possible about that experience, but I want to go to the end before we go back to the beginning. Here we are 19 years later, when we caught up before Christmas, you were still very, very passionate about your visit that you'd had here all those years ago. Why has that still been in the front of your mind? Well, we were we had been running clubs in Leeds for 10 years um, when you contacted us. So 1992 we'd started. And... You know, I'd always been really, really passionate about um, making Leeds a better place for myself and the people that lived here. It was my home city and, you know, everything that, that we had done had been for, for people of Leeds. And we weren't ever interested in being a nightclub that toured and went to Ibiza and those kind of things because we were really interested in building a community and certainly, you know, creating a safe space for people that had often been overlooked in nightclubs. Um, so. When we got the call from you and, um, and you know, you asked us if we would work out in Bosnia, which obviously had um, there'd been such a horrific war out there that we'd just seen on the news, really. You know, whilst we were all raving and partying in Leeds, we'd just seen it on TV and, you know, it was, a, it was remote. So I suppose going, you know, being invited out there was such an absolute shock because you know, we actually weren't taken that seriously by a lot of people in the industry here because probably because we weren't girls. We The colour, the club was very colourful. It was very bright. It appeared to be very light, even though we did have very strict politics. And, and you know, you came along and kind of validated what we were doing, really, and understood how... Um, I suppose you really seem to understand how uh, important club culture is um, and how it can affect change and you know really kind of touch um, young people and inspire them really and that it clubs are often dismissed in my mind as being quite superficial environments and and I don't really think they are I think all a lot of really important stuff happens in those spaces where people feel free and they can express themselves. You started Speed Queen in Leeds because well, I don't want to tell too much of the story because I think that it's such a fantastic story and I think it would inspire not only people listening to this podcast um, in the United Kingdom, I'm really hoping it's going to re-inspire young people that listen to this in Bosnia-Herzegovina, but it's a good story for young people around the world. For those that don't know, a squat is like a pretty crummy place to live, old, desolate building that nobody's living in. And traditionally, students or people that are, are on hard times occupy. Susie, you were living in a squat, but studying in one of the most prestigious art colleges in the world, in London. When you were there at that time, did you ever think that the story you're about to tell us about how you managed to open Speed Queen and the obstacles that you came across, did, in those days of squat life, did you ever think that this would all end up being so fabulously successful uh, and coming to a country that most probably most people in the world had never even heard of? Absolutely not. And, and not for... For the, for the 10 years earlier that I worked either, I mean, it was inconceivable. And, you know, I never set out to be a club promoter, let alone to kind of work with, you know, the British Army and yourself. Um, I think, you know, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I grew up and obviously I wanted to be, I did want to be an artist and I actually became quite disillusioned with the art world. Um, and I realised when I was studying that I didn't really want to make art for galleries for what seemed like a very elite uh, environment. And I, did, I didn't feel that like any connection with it. I didn't feel like I was welcomed or I belonged or anything. And really kind of when I came back to Leeds, um, there'd been a terrible recession, shiny cosmopolitan city. And it was, you know, it was it was rough and it was hard. And um, so there wasn't really anywhere to go out and, you know, hardly any many, many places. So it was really just kind of the idea was to create something where we could actually have our own space. I don't know if I had a dream to change the world, but I definitely knew that I wanted, like, um, I definitely knew that Leeds could be better than it was. And, um, you know, it was my home city. So, you know, I did want to play my part in making it a better place. But it just really started with, you know, a small club that um, that we ran called the Kit Kat Club. And everything just kind of escalated from there, really. And it was... It was just a place for us to go out and, you know, other people that, you know, like the same things as us. And it was just to have fun, really. You know, it was like there wasn't very many places to go out in Leeds. So we used to have a flat and I'd just say, oh, we'll make a Spanish party and we just make parties in the flat. And it was just, you know, it was just fun. It, we weren't really very serious. And it wasn't until... Um, I started working in the nightclubs and I realised that there was the problems, you know, that it was a very aggressive space, it was very male dominated, it was very homophobic, it was very sexist. And I just, I just realised that I could do something about it. And probably nobody else was going to at that time, you know, in that space. So it, it wasn't, it wasn't strategic. <laughs> And it was just a direct response, really, to what was happening around me. And I just thought, that's not right. I'll do something about that. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you would like to support us and the production of future episodes, then please consider maybe buying us a coffee. The link to do that is in the show notes for this podcast. When I was reading the transcript of a previous interview, you did, when you set up one, I believe, at the start, somebody was pretty, well, a guy actually, was being pretty aggressive to you. And you, the, the courage that you showed by going to your bouncer and saying, throwing him out, which he did. And what happened next? And I was totally shocked when you, when you never let the guy back in, ever. Was it really scary back then? I mean, it's scary being a girl I know in the club scene anyway, or I would imagine. When that happened, did you think, I've, I, th this is, I've, got, I've got a passion now. If I can do this, I'm, I'm going to be successful. Leeds was... You know, you kind of grew up in Leeds and, you know, and it, it was there was a drinking culture. So it was rough. And, you know, nightclubs are about essentially boys going out and getting completely drunk and either having fights or wanting to pick up girls. And, you know, you would kind of accept that you just kind of boys could just do whatever they wanted. And it, so it, it was that that was really the culture. Um, but. I mean, the rave scene came along and it did change all of that, you know, that whole kind of, you know, everything kind of got better when people stopped drinking, you know, so heavily. But I don't know. I just felt it was like an epiphany. I mean, one one night, you know, a, a, a gay boy came in and a doorman had a knee jerk homophobic reaction and just punched him in the nose and broke his nose. And that was OK back then in Leeds. It was okay to do that. Bouncers could do whatever they wanted, and you know, the, the, there just weren't any kind of rules really. And I just thought it was really, really wrong. And I just had this moment when I just thought, it doesn't have to be like that for anybody. So, you know, and I think when you're very young, you know, you can probably you don't think too much about the consequences. You just start, you know, telling people what you think, don't you? And this is this is wrong. And and um, and they didn't understand. You know, the doorman didn't understand, the nightclub owner didn't understand what the problem was. So we had to move to a lot of different clubs and, you know, had a lot of different kind of incarnations to get to that point. It, it was hard work. And I do remember a big, a really big promoter came to Leeds from Manchester and said to me, when I said I'm going to open this club when everybody's going to be mixed together from different backgrounds, different sexualities, different races, and he was like, you can't do that. That won't work in Leeds. There'll be bloodshed. It won't work. And I was like, well, I'm just an ordinary girl from Leeds. So if I want that, there must be loads of other people that want that.
and and I just kind of it was quite instinctive really and I was right stumbled across you and I saw this amazing club and when you arrived here yeah before we talk about that um what was it like you know when we said would you come on that first trip what was the reaction to your team I mean, I, I can't imagine what it's like when you're there in a, in a really Gucci club environment. You know, you, you know the vibe, you know what you're going to do. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, oh, we're going to Bosnia. Some people must have said, what? Where? Why? What was the reaction? We all said that. And we all said that. And I think, I mean, obviously, back in the day, we still had uh, landlines. We just had a landline in the office and we just got a telephone call. So it was all just like, what? what really you know you know and then it was like you know we they want us to go to bosnia and it was like like i said at the time nightclubs were going to ibiza and that's what nightclubs did so this was like the biggest curveball and it was like bosnia and you couldn't just kind of look things up on the internet then so we didn't really kind of know that much about it and you know when we started to kind of ask people all our staff were just incredible everybody just was like yes absolutely i'm coming definitely i mean it was hard for us to pick really because you know we everybody the whole club would have come if, if you could have chartered 100 planes all of the clubbers would have come as well. i was thinking about this during the night knowing that we were going to be chatting today. And I have to, to confess, so, sometimes for me these days, it's difficult to go back that far and to remember all the details because the whole experience of those years was just so intense. But I, I remember my team coming along and saying, boss, 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 look at, look what they've brought. And I, it, it what? And I, I, I'd known that people that had come out to help before, you know, had bought record decks and bits and pieces that DJs needed. You brought all the dressings for a club. I was, I remember being totally, I don't know whether I was in, in awe or suffering serious shock. But when we, when, when I went into that sort of like, we'll call it a disused warehouse in the Bujak area of Banja Luka and saw your team putting things together, I just wondered, how did, how did you know what to bring, what not to bring? I mean, the, the, the Air Force at that time said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take stuff uh, across, but I don't even, think i remember the movements guy saying david do you know what they've brought did you dream up how you were going to dress this had you got this idea in your head before you came to this place in northwest bosnia that how you what you were going to do how you were going to do it it was really really simple we had the club in leeds we, you know we used to kind of set up every single saturday and it would be like a production a bit like theater we'd spend the whole day with a team from nine o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night setting everything up just for this one night to transform the space because we just rented the space on a Saturday and then we'd take it all back down again on the Monday. So, as I said before, we didn't want to be a nightclub that just toured with a DJ and a banner ever, which is why we didn't do it. So we decided that we just pick up Leeds and everything we did in Leeds and bring it to Bosnia because we felt that it was so important what you'd asked us to do that we wanted the all the people that were going to come to our events to have the full experience. And that wasn't just the DJs. That was all of the visuals and the decor and the light boxes and this whole world that we created so that people could walk into a kind of a wonderland and a fantasy world and and discover other parts of themselves and let down all those barriers that they have and all those the stress that you get from, you know, outside life and all the people that you're told you have to be, you know, because of your religion or your upbringing. So we wanted to give that to the people of Bosnia because that's what we were doing in Leeds and that's what you that's what you wanted, that's what you'd asked for. You asked for Speed Queen and that's what we were. So we were like, we're all or nothing. So it was, and it was great because setting it up and seeing how the, the, the young people responded to it and, you know, all the differences. And we even we even had our light, we had a lot of light boxes with uh, words, like positive words that we'd had remade in, in, in the language uh, so that, you know, we really did think about it like that. Yeah, we changed the words so that it was written in Bosnian rather than English. We sat on a, I've got I've got this really poor quality photograph of a younger Susie and a much younger David sat on a couch and I was interviewing you during the afternoon and you were as 
like vibrant and as enthusiastic as ever. But the shock of it all was when you started putting up trapeze into the roof, you know, I immediately thought, health and safety, health and safety, what's going to happen? And I, don't, I can't remember the names of those really cool girls that you had. They were strapping up these things and it was just like a circus. And I thought, I wonder the impact when people walk in is going to be stunning because I have to say, I did stay in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm here today and nothing, absolutely nothing has been recreated in this country, like those events that you put on. You did bring Speed Queen to this country. And the only sad thing about the whole thing is that Speed Queen didn't have a franchise here. But when all that was going up, the glint in your eye told me that it was going to be a fantastic evening. Did you have any reservations for that first big event that you put on here? You know, our team, seriously professional, like the Trapeze Girls, um, you know, they did work with the circus and they knew exactly what they were doing. You know, we weren't kind of fly by night cowboys and we were doing this every single week, you know, in Leeds. So, you know, the, the team were really, you know, they were professional. So we weren't, we didn't really have any concerns about health and safety or anything like that. We were more, you know, we had no idea how we were going to be received. I know we did one club that was a really strong techno club and, you know, they didn't want like, like happy house and they told us when we were setting up that they didn't want it and they didn't like it um but we went ahead anyway because you know we just did what we we'd come to do and they ended up loving it absolutely loving it probably because maybe because there was all of that decor and the visuals it allowed them to kind of pretend you were somewhere else as well for a night and the space wasn't so familiar do you think escapism helps people when they're in bad situations I think everybody in whatever situation needs to know there are other options, that there are other ways of doing things, there's other ways of living, you know, that may be more positive than they can imagine and have a space where, you know, that is encouraged or nurtured. I mean, yeah, I think it's really important to, to show people that there is, you know, there's other ways of living, really. There's an alternative and it can be more positive. It can be brighter. It can be creative. You know, creativity is a gateway for lots of young people to unlock all sorts of things inside themselves. My first gig that I organised here was, you know, bringing Boy George across. OK, George is George. I found a, an old CD-ROM. Remember those things? Goodness. I found a CD-ROM. I have an iMac now, which doesn't have a CD player. We've come that far. Anyway, I managed to scrounge around to get the machine that would hook up by USB. And I found the photographs that were taken that night. Not too many of them, I must admit. And I put them online. And, you know, does anybody want a copy? Were you there that night? And you do these things online and come on, not everything goes viral. And so many people got in touch and said, wow, yeah, that's me. And can I have so many copies and all the rest of it? Those people now, Susie, are... CEOs, captains of industry. I don't know if we've got any politicians yet. I don't think so. These are people that have grown up and experienced something that the younger people uh, haven't got today. Back in Britain, Britain's got issues. Every country's got issues at the moment. Do you think that if you were a younger Susie today, would you have done Speed Queen all over again? Or do you think it would be something different now because times have changed? Or are young people's needs and aspirations the same for every generation? I think they're the same. And I've actually been told by young people today that they would really love that space to exist in Leeds as a weekly. I don't think that there'll ever be a time where people don't have a need to come together in a safe environment and listen to music, dance, make friendships, build communities, you know, talk about dreams and possibilities of making things better and, and have that kind of, you know, a, a platform as well like speed queen offered young people in the city a chance to dj to make decor you know to work on the door to to learn loads and loads of skills that then and they have a lot of them gone on to have like really successful careers that have you know those early days of working in nightclubs um have, have given them and there was there were just numerous jobs for people to do you know we had a kitchen we had a door there was rigging that like I say there was the more glamorous jobs but there were also all the background jobs was all the you know the running of the office and so there was always a place for people to get involved so I fundamentally that's got to be a good thing for any place that they've got a hub or somewhere where young people can gravitate because you, you can't work in a vacuum you can't work creatively in a vacuum you need a, a scene you need somebody to make something happen or if it's not happening maybe make it yourself which is 
really what we did. And it is possible to do that. I think maybe now, you know, like say in Leeds, things are harder because it's a very, it's a much more prosperous city. The rents are a lot higher. You know, everything costs a lot more and that can make it prohibitively expensive for entry level ideas, which is, that's always kind of sad, you know, that, that spaces aren't kind of made for, for young independent people. But it won't ever go away. And I thought that our job was done in Leeds and we didn't need to exist anymore. But, you know, like you say, it seems that however far we come as society and things get better and less prejudiced, it always will default back to negativity if people don't keep chipping away at it and keep kind of pushing those barriers of of people being included and not bigoted and not prejudiced. It seems that that work will always be there. For somebody to do. Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, all these years later, we're talking now 19 years after we started doing some projects uh, together, still cannot reconcile the reality of life today, especially when it comes to things like LBGTQ, alternative lifestyles. It's still very much, and I'm, I'll put my, my neck on the block here, still so very, very, very much hidden away. 20 years ago, when Speed Queen came to Banja Luka, you were already pioneering that back in the UK, weren't you? Yeah, we were. And and even though, you know, we've made huge progress in this country, you know, things are very, very different from the, how they were in the 90s. Um, th- there's still that work to be done. And, you know, it, that's it's, it's universal, isn't it? Like you say, in Bosnia, somebody has to kind of start to kind of uh, be brave enough, really, I suppose, to say, you know, we exist as alternative people and we, we're we valid and we're allowed to, you know, have a space and just not have to be hidden away, really. You know, though, when, when, when you came, and, and I know that you mixed around with the audience, you were looking at the audience, and I know a lot of the, uh, the Speed Queen team uh, were chatting away. I, I remember seeing lots of beer and rakia being drunk with everybody and, and, a, and a fantastic time was being had by all. But when you came, you didn't, sort of like say hey this is what we what our core belief is back then did you get any sense that the underground sexual differences came out at all during those uh, gigs that you had from the audience or do you think or did you recognize that they were they were deliberately de- you know suppressing themselves um i don't think we thought about uh, bosnia in terms of you know lgbt rights or people's sexuality because everything that we were hearing from people like in the clubs was they couldn't believe it was happening they couldn't believe we were there they hadn't been uh, exposed to music and art and magazines and fashion and all the stuff that you could take for granted you know growing up in the uk they hadn't had so you know it was much more about connecting with the outside world it was a, a bigger picture for us and and they talked a lot about their religion and not being able to love each other from different religions we heard that a lot you know that once it was great whilst the music was playing there could be there was a lot of secret loves between muslims and catholics and but that um when the music stopped everything kind of just went back to how it was yeah that's 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 still uh here quite a lot at the moment which which it which is sad, which is sad, really. But if something happens regularly, then it starts to filter out more into kind of everyday life rather than just one-off events where you can't kind of create anything post that event. You know, there needs to be something that's happening regularly in a town or a city. You're listening to the Living in Bosnia and Herzegovina podcast. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you would like to support us and the production of future episodes, then please consider maybe buying us a coffee. The link to do that is in the show notes for this podcast. The gigs that you did were tremendously successful. And, you know, when you mentioned Speed Queen, even today, if you can find the people of the age group, they will reflect very positively on it. What a lot of people, when I speak to them about Speed Queen, they don't realise is on one of the visits here, the team went off piste, if I can use that phrase, to visit a hospital on the outskirts of Banja Luka, where you spent a considerable amount of time with your team focusing on disabled children. Today, if you walk around anywhere in the country, and and once again, I'll stick my neck neck out, you very, very rarely find disabled people on the streets. They're still 
hidden away. On that day when, when we pulled up outside and all those young children were waiting for you, what are your memories of, of that visit? My memories of working with the children are the, are the strongest, really, um, because obviously we were used to working with clubbers and it was what we did and what we thought we were coming out to do. So working with the children, and we worked with quite a lot of different children, um, it was the most powerful because we hadn't, you said to me, I think at the very last minute, oh, will you work with children as well? And I was like, yeah, um, not knowing what that would entail. But like you say, to see so many children kind of um, hidden away because of disability, um, you know, it's not it's not so much like that here. It was joyous. I mean, because the joy that those children had and that they gave us as well. I mean, we were doing all the the workshops with, um, you know, the we had all the sound system set up, and they were they were bongo playing, and they were making music, and they were had, doing face painting and dancing and percussion, and they were just it was joyous. But I did notice that um, on the walls, I you know, the artwork was really some of the artwork that the children had done was very sad and very dark and and that's when um myself and Kaz my you know my co-promoter we decided to leave all the decor for you um at, the, at that children's home with all the because it was all really colorful cutouts of of animals and flowers and all sorts of random objects that we'd done from different parties because that really struck me that the the environments were very um gray I think we came back really upset as well because we wanted to do more and we didn't really know how to and it seemed so far away as well and it was really hard to kind of follow through you know afterwards not just go once really and then it was it just kind of it, it everybody was touched by that trip so much I don't think any of us didn't come away kind of crying or scratching our heads because all the staff as well they were just working in clothes because it was cool and fun and you know so again it kind of just made you think in a different way really last year i i broke my ankle and um i had to go back to that hospital to have a number of screws taken out uh, of my ankle but we're not talking about my ankle but what we are talking about is i walked down the corridor immediately got propelled back as i walked past one door of a girl that was hugging you so much that she didn't want to let you go. And I started to get quite emotional about that. How do you cope with having had that experience and you go back? I mean, it, yes, it makes things worthwhile, but do you also feel like I do at times quite sad about the whole thing? Yeah, I, I, I think that's what kind of drives me to kind of keep going, really, because there's always something to be done. There's always somebody that a little bit of attention or some brightness or something and you know you can't you can't ever underestimate what that kind of means just to connect with one person and give them a bit of time or something that they need so there's nothing else in life really is there except kind of you know the world is what it is and it's there's lots of things that you cannot change about it you know in the bigger picture you for me personally the only thing that that we can change is on the ground one-to-one making people you know feel empowered or feel better about themselves I do remember one party we did was for um a school girl and it was in a school and she had from what I remember had, had asked for us to go and make this party because she wanted to learn how to do it herself and you know she wanted to make parties and it's that it, you know you don't know do you what your influence is going to be I mean I'm quite taken aback to this day of how people talk to me about that time back in England back in Leeds and how it affected them you know and what they've gone on to do with with that experience I was about to say when you went back to Leeds when everything had had finished how did they react to the stories that you told were they like dismissive of it or did they just say I'm, I'm shocked and I don't know what to say I think everybody knew in Leeds what Speed Queen was about and I, I just think that I think people were I suppose because it was all kind of pre-social media, we didn't share a lot of stuff. So we talked to people, but, you know, things weren't shared as much. Like if I imagine that experience happening now, everything would be translated back to the club as live as we were doing it. So, you know, it was really something that we'd experienced as a as a group of, of, of you know, the staff and, and at, at Speed Queen. So... It was more that I think we were all different and it gave us a, a renewed impetus to kind of keep going because 
we were doing lots of charity work as well in Leeds and it was all very you know we didn't talk about it we didn't tell people about it particularly it wasn't really that culture of, of that time either whereas everything is shared now isn't it like every single thing that people do every good deed that people do now is shared like re on Instagram you know um, but it was a very different time and I think you know people were a bit more private maybe about things that they did I, th I think with social media now if if we were to do it all over again with social media, I actually think we could move a mountain. I really, really do. We'll just we'll just go off off track just just for a few minutes. Leeds, I believe, is going to be a city of culture for twenty twenty three, and within that sort of like year of culture, you're documenting the impact that what you've been involved with has had in the city. And you said, you know, part of that is the trip that we did to Bosnia. That's some undertaking, really, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're talking 19 years ago, holes, you know, our, 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 our memories turn into like Swiss cheese. I don't know. I, I'm still trying to look through thousands of these old fashioned CDs for grainy images that I don't know, you wouldn't be able to even post on Instagram these days. It's such poor quality. How difficult is is that project for you at the moment? Well, at the moment, it's um, it's in its early kind of exploratory stages. But I think it comes back to what you said, asked me earlier about, you know, being young and having no money and living in London and ending up with this really, really unusual career because I never planned to be a club promoter. And um, and I've always kind of tried to make sense of it. And so from a personal point of view, I wanted to kind of record this story for, for Leeds and because a lot of people, there's been so many new people coming into Leeds and they don't necessarily have family here, you know, grandparents, parents. So they haven't got that history of Leeds. And I am one story, one part of that history of Leeds that might never be told. So there's that. But there's also there's thousands of people that came through the club and they've all got stories of growing up in Leeds or moving here and having this experience and um, and why it's important to, to have this this kind of space. So I'm going to create an archive, essentially, for, you know, the future, future generations. And that will be like an audio archive that hopefully will sit in, in a museum or, you know, West Yorkshire archives. And but also from that, we're going to make loads of podcasts and interview lots of people and collecting all the ephemera. And within that, the Bosnia story is really, really important because, you know, it's not nightclubs don't tend to do things like that do they and also um another huge reason for this project is to really start to make new collaborations with people and the younger generation and there's this whole creative community that's grown up through the clubs of the 90s um and there's a new generation coming up and what we could actually all do together now um, because you know the world's different you know we've all it's easier to connect isn't it now so the idea of having kind of new collaborations, new creative projects led me to talking to you again about would it be possible to do something between Leeds and Bosnia again, you know, with some of the people that maybe of that generation or whatever you felt was needed in, in that country. Because, like I said, the work's never done, is it? And certainly for children that are, you know, children and children, you know, that are going through difficult times. I think it'd be amazing to kind of reconnect 20 years later. You know, I don't know. It's, it's very, very exciting, but I don't know where it's going to end up. <laughs> I've learned not to think about, I've learned not to think about, you know, where things are going to end up, just to work kind of, uh, do the best you can at the time for the right reasons and you'll end up where you're meant to be. <laughs> I think I sent you a link to a music podcast that is uh, produced, delivered via YouTube. It's produced from a team of, I don't say young people anymore because I'm sure that they're over 30 and they would most probably feel quite insulted by it. But using electronic music, cl club music from a variety of locations, especially around this part of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And they team up with the new generation of, of artists, whether they be the type of artist that does large street art on the side of buildings or otherwise. And there are small organisations now teaching kids how to mix music and all the rest of it. But I, I also think that, you know, there's th these are all, all things that happen 
like insular things, which most probably should have some more of a network feel for it so it gets more awareness. And, you know, I was about to say, I nearly fell off my chair here, which has been squeaking during this uh, podcast, by the way, when I said, you know, about what would happen if we had social media today, Instagram, you know, TikTok and and all, all the rest of it. And you said, yeah, I think you were saying, well, why don't we do it? Um, here's a question for you, Susie, and, and, and I know you're well enough that you won't get um, insulted at all. I'll preface it with this. In the culture here, when you get to a certain age, you know, you get grey hair, you get grey beards and whatever. And then you're sort of like elevated in, the, in this position of, you know it all and young people don't know anything. You've got grey hair now. You never used to have. I've definitely got grey hair, a receding hairline, and we're not the youngest of people. I just wonder, the thought went through my mind when you said that. I wonder what it would, ha- what the response would be from people in, in this part of the world, in the Western Balkans, if two grey, crinkly people wanted to pull off what young people should really be doing on their own now. Well, I don't think that we'd approach it that way, would we? I think um, I've got to a stage where, you know, I, I've got a lot of experience as well and making things happen, you don't have to be the person out front either. Um, but it's more, you know, facilitate facilitating things for young people and facilitating things for people that need it. Not that older people don't need to kind of, it's really important for the generations to mix together. Intergenerational working is is amazing because you have different skill sets, different knowledge. One isn't better than the other. They're just different. So, you know, it's about working collaboratively. And from what, what I see here in Leeds, that the younger generation are really, really open to collaborating with older people and interested. And, you know, I do remember being kind of in my 20s and thinking, you know, that, you know, people in their 50s didn't, weren't really maybe relatable in some way or didn't, I don't think that that's true. I just think you just build a team, don't you? And you build a team with the, the people that are interested in what you're interested in and you, you have a common vision and you make it happen and everybody finds their place. I mean, Kaz, she used to run up the ladders, rigging everything, you know, for those nights. Well, you know, she still got all of that vision for the clubs, but she might not want to be climbing up the ladders and doing the rigging herself, but there'd be somebody young that would love to do that. So you just you're sharing your knowledge and your experiencing, and you're working collaboratively. So I don't I don't see age as a as a kind of a barrier at all. You just build a team of everybody. Society works with people of all generations, doesn't it? You have to have young people and older people for everything to be kind of like a you know kind of in harmony and it's it's the same in, in, a, in a in a creative space or a nightclub you just I, I saw that podcast and to see those young girls um you know DJ making art in this beautiful gallery it was just awe inspiring and I literally wanted to get in a plane and go over and 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 be there and experience that and talk to them and I don't think they'd be like oh we don't want to talk to you you've got great hair or to invite them to Leeds or to do something virtually with Leeds. I mean, you know, so you have to use your age as a as something positive, don't you? Because if you're lucky enough if you're lucky enough to live a full life, you know, and, and get to any age over fifty, you know, you then do something positive with it. Last time when you came, it was you and I um did we have email back then? Did we? We used telephones. It was, it was telephones, I remember. God, you go and see those now in museums, don't you? Yeah, I remember my daughter asking me what one was when she was little and it had one of those dial-up, uh, you know, the dial, and she was pressing it. She was like, what is it? What does it do? Now, that made, that made me feel old. <laughs> you know, for this documentation of club life and, and how that has affected people in, in Leeds and, and, and the Bosnia story part of that, and then I'm thinking about how... Is, is the best way to do that. And I'm getting the feeling that we have to get you back, even for a short time, to walk the streets again, maybe visit one or two locations again, if we can find people that were there at the time to talk to them. But more importantly, to get the, the reality check of what you did and, and what was achieved and, and what wasn't achieved and what possibly could be achieved now. And maybe a couple maybe a couple of gray-haired people are the sort of people that at least can make that work i mean when we went out there it was 2002 it was very raw 
um, you know, the war hadn't been over very long. So um, now, obviously, you've got a whole generation of people that have grown up post-war and will have some perspective. And, you know, it, it must be completely different. I don't think anybody was, you know, when we went out there, it was still just a question of... Uh, being safe because of the landmine situation we were told we couldn't you know walk anywhere go anywhere off the beaten track it was very very dangerous um it was very bleak you know there was um i learned a lot in bosnia i learned a lot about um uh huge international charity corruption and it validated a lot of the things i was doing back in leeds like working on a really grassroots level because i could see that that's what really did make a difference and what really works because you know working with people that weren't corrupt like tamra and you know that that was a it made me feel that that was the right way to, to to kind of keep going rather than just giving money, say, to... You could run club nights and give money to, to big charities, you know, huge worldwide charities, but, you know, it, 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 you don't really know what's happening to that money. Whereas, like you said before, we went into the children's hospital and we worked directly with the children and we directly gave them things and we knew that they would benefit from that. And it's... Um, so to... To see what people need now, like, and be able to kind of make those direct links between people, and I think it, it must be easier now to work, you know, from two different cities like this, because you know, because of technology and be able to have conversations with people. Susie, we're coming to the, you know, we could talk forever about this. You've had an amazing life helping people. You've even got a daughter now who's eighteen. Is she now? She's twenty-one. Twenty-one. She was, she was two, yeah, she was two when we came to Bosnia. Oh my my! So you've seen a lot and helped a lot. It's always difficult, I think, to ask this question, um, and it puts a lot of people on the spot. But family issues aside, what sort of plans and projects go through Susie Mason's mind at the moment? Well, this this idea that I had to to document you know, the clubs and um, over the next 30 years, I think that's going to keep me really, really busy um, for the next few years. <laughs> but it's the, it's all of the spin-offs that could come from that because there are already conversations that I'm having with people about what this archive could become and what, 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 it, what it could be, um, you know, as a living oral history, not just... A lovely finite book there's been lots and lots of club culture documented recently and it's always beautiful kind of photographs of that time but you don't know the stories of those people in those pictures they, they look fabulous but you don't know who those people were and you know why they were having that experience and what it meant to them and that's what I'm trying to do and have that filter out into you know you know that could develop into like I said before, maybe working with some people out in Bosnia, talking about their clubbing experiences now. So we start to open up lots of new dialogues and conversations with different sets of people and create new connections. And I don't know where that's going to end up, but I do think it could be quite amazing. And appropriate for somebody that's got grey hair and is old and maybe not on the dance floor every Saturday night in really high, high platform shoes and false eyelashes. Um. Are you talking about me? If you like. <laughs> <laughs> Susie, I, I, what I think we, we, we need to do as we bring this short chat, um, this particular time, because there's so much more to, to talk about and we've just skimmed the surface, is for people that are listening <clears throat> in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to this and they would have questions that they would just like to ask you directly, what would be the best way for them to, to get in contact and say, hey, I was listening to this podcast and, you know, you stimulated me or you're, you've inspired me to do something, but I'm a little bit unsure. Can you give me some tips and tricks? How, how could people contact you? Ah, well, that, that's something really interesting. Obviously, we have... Um we have the Speed Queen Facebook page, um, and I am in the process of setting up um, some new platforms for this project, which will be up by spring. Um, but I don't know. What do you think? What do you think we could do? Something kind of some kind of 
webinar or I I, 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 I don't know um I don't know what we'll talk offline yeah 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 I, I think it would be great to have some kind of online space where we could facilitate that not as a one-off but just as something that could be kind of rolling where we could encourage some kind of conversations as well um and anybody can contact me on my email as well which i can you can attach to this can't you the, the one that i used earlier yeah yeah okay so if anybody if anybody's listening at the, if anybody's listening to well i hope people are listening at the moment um then uh, in the show notes i'll put uh susie's contact email address Finally, then, Susie, for people that feel that they that they want to do things like you've done in your life, what is your one piece of advice for anybody that is listening now and thinking, God, I wish I could do something like that? What would it be? You can. You absolutely can. Anybody can. I was just an ordinary girl from Leeds, and I just made something that I just wanted to exist and it doesn't you don't have to think big you don't have to think long term you you really just something for now and just um just get a, a f- you only need a few people you only really need a handful of people that feel the same way to start to create something and to support each other to make it happen and just one step at a time but lots and lots of things have been changed in the world and made better in the world by just ordinary people just thinking I'll just have a go and if it doesn't work it doesn't work because even if it doesn't work and lots of things I've done haven't worked um it always takes you to another place and it always you always end up meeting different people and it's it's all part of your journey so it doesn't even matter if 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 it doesn't work out how you imagine it in your head because it will take you somewhere Susie, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honour and so lovely to reconnect with you again. And I can't wait I can't wait to see what we're going to do this year. <laughs> it's 20 years, 2022. We came, in the November, we came in the November 2002. Susie Mason there, talking about Speed Queen's emotional visit to Bosnia and Herzegovina some 20 years ago and the impact it had on both her and her colleagues. As you could tell, there's still a lot of work to do regarding inter-ethnic tolerance here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And maybe, just maybe, the Speed Queen philosophy can help again. Time, of course, will tell. Well, thanks for listening to this episode. Do leave a review, either way, plus or minus, as it does really help us. And if you'd like to support us, then maybe consider buying us a coffee. The link to do that is also in the show notes. So until next time from us here in Chidarchini, please do stay safe wherever you are in the world.